Okay, let's start off from the beginning. All right, here we go. Okay. Thank you. So good morning. I'm going to kick off talking about innovation in the ocean. Planet Earth, 70% ocean. Perhaps we should be calling our home Planet Ocean. Some quick facts about the ocean. More than 50% of our oxygen is generated by the ocean. More than half the world's population today still depends on the ocean for their primary source of protein. 90% of global trade goes by ship. The, if the ocean was a country as a GDP, it'd be the seventh largest in the world, and it's growing faster than the global GDP on average. We're approaching 9 billion people. Almost 40 to as high as 50% of the world lives along the coast, and there's this trend towards mega cities, which is not just happening in parts of Asia. You can just check it out by hanging out in Boston and seeing how the traffic is. <laughs> this is a picture of, uh, this is a photo of Shanghai. On top of those three points I just made is the rise of the Asian middle class and the wealth creation that's happening in Asia. Today, today's generation of Chinese eat twice as much protein as their parents chicken, poultry, pig, seafood. For many Chinese families, the car that they just bought is the first car that the family's ever had. So our consumption levels are going through a trajectory. We, as humans on our planet Earth, or planet ocean, looks like there's gonna be more stress on the ocean. Eight million tons of plastics is what is estimated goes into the ocean per year. And even what happens upstream, the pesticides we use, the insecticides that we use, whether that be for the food we eat, for the, where we golf, or even our own lawns. What happens when it rains? It goes out to sea. Climate change. Rising sea levels, rising temperature, changes in the water pH. We barely know anything about our ocean today. We definitely don't have a good grip about what's going to happen to the ocean for the next 50 to 100 years. Uh, common statistic from the UN, 90% of global fisheries today are either overfished or atfished. Uh, I, I just would add one nuance, particularly for New England, is that within America's exclusive economic zone, 200 miles, our, our fisheries are heavily regulated. There are a lot of um, biomass of unutilized fish, and then our waters are as clean as they've ever been, so we have a vaxy, very vibrant aquaculture sector. So we, as consumers, citizens, people on Earth, what's the view of the ocean? Um, it's big, uh, really big. It's over the horizon. I don't know if I really have an impact. I kind of see what I see here. I see ground pollution. I see other issues at home. Don't think too much about the ocean. You know, some can say it's the ultimate tragedy of the commons. Another perception of the waterfront in our coastal communities. It's not associated with the new economy. You don't associate the coastal areas with high growth. You don't necessarily associate the coastal areas with innovation and science. Um, you might think it's not very sustainable, or you may think it's actually very dirty, or you may just think that the waterfront really is where a lot of the wealthy just play. So see ahead, our mission as a public benefit corp is to really catalyze this intersection of innovation ocean, and sustainability, so blue tech. Let's go back 20 years. 20 years ago, when I first came out of grad school, I started to look at clean tech. Solar was at least 10 times more expensive than what it is today. There were no electric cars on a road, and what kept giving us light at night was these two types of lights, as opposed to the LEDs. So a lot has changed in the last 20 years. Can blue tech today be what maybe clean tech was 10 years ago? Let's go forward 10 years. Food, land-based food, most of it. So the food industry in the United States particularly is going through some significant structural changes, really because we as consumers are doing three things differently. One, you pick up the package, you turn it around, and you start reading what's on the back. We're looking for healthier options. Two, local, having a choice between lettuce, and eggs that are regional and local versus on a truck from 3,000 miles away, we all pay a bit more to buy local. Why do we do that? Carbon footprint, environmental footprint, we want the money to go back into our community. We like our community to be more diverse from an economic perspective, where we'd like to live maybe among our farmers and as such. 
Three, sustainability. How is the food made? So how has this manifested itself? Organic food continues to grow very healthily. Now you're seeing it in the conventional stores, not just in the premium. And since this topic is about innovation, $10 billion last year of venture capital has gone into food and ag, food delivery apps, precision ag tied to drones, alternatives to pesticide, organic chicken tethers, squeezies, you, you name it. So venture capitalists, investors, they don't, start, they don't start the party. Sometimes, usually, they're not even the first ones to show up. When a venture capitalist shows up at a party, it's because, one, they feel that there's structural change or disruption, Two, there's growth later on top of innovation. So that's the land-based food. So let's go to the other side of the supermarket. Seafood. Despite our waters being much cleaner, despite us actually having healthy biomass of wild fish or aquaculture, we in the US import 90% of our seafood. And what we catch, what we make, we export 40%. Sustainability. If, does it really make sense to capture a lot of small wild fish, grind it up, and feed it for tilapia or even chicken? Health. Um, I remember 15 years ago, I was sitting at a salad bar, or standing in the salad bar going, and I just asked myself, how can you have all you can eat shrimp and this be so cheap? Well, I found out later what the answer is that. Same questions we're asking in land-based food aren't necessarily being asked on seafood, the antibiotics, the hormones, all the industrialized farming that happens so we can have our all-you-can-eat shrimp. So where are we going? Hopefully today. So we are seeing the first wave of innovation versus traceability. If fish are particularly harder to trace because of particularly large fish, they get cut up, they get distributed. So you're having a bunch of new startups, not far from here in New England, um, that are looking at digitizing the traceability to prove that the fish actually came from where it came from and in, even using blockchain. There, I said blockchain. I, had, I was told I had to say that somewhere in innovation. <laughs> Two, digital, digital oysters. Right now, many of our farmers are still using pen and paper. So unlike what's happened in the food space, in the land-based food space seven or eight years ago, this, we have a lot of startups around digital oysters. Can you get the farmer some better data? Can you digitize the cold chain, the supply chain? B2B, B2C apps, so that we as consumers can be better connected to the small regional farmers or fishermen. So that's in the seafood. All right, let's move to the waterfront. First, let's talk about ships. Ships today, the, the shipping industry is being regulated heavily, really for the first time. Uh, the smokestack, the traditional smog, the particulate matter, sulfuric acid. These are pollutants that were regulated in energy and land-based transportation many years ago that are just hitting the shipping industry. Ballast water, invasive species. When you pick up warm critters in the ballast of a ship in Hong Kong, as you dock in Long Beach, the Coast Guard says you can't discharge your ballast water full of those critters anymore. You have to kill everything. The other thing about the shipping industry, they're getting hacked, the digitization. So here's an industry that traditionally is very solid, and they know they have to innovate. Let's go to the port. Let's go to the port of LA, Long, uh, Los Angeles. It's counterintuitive. The number one driver of the pollution in the port of LA is not all the cars backed up on I-10. It's the port itself. It's the trucks. It's the port operations. It's the ships. The Port of LA and Long Beach announced at least $6 million they're going to spend to clean up the port for ground-based emissions. So they have to innovate. Three, offshore wind. The United States has 30 megawatts of offshore wind spinning in Rhode Island. Almost two gigawatts of RFPs have just been issued in offshore wind. Those and another at least 10 gigawatts is expected to come out within the next few years. So where are these turbines going to be built? They're going to be built in our ports. So we're talking about good working class jobs, particularly with the issue of income and inequality, where you can argue that our ports are in the future. What we want to focus is on the innovation. Can we bring smart data, smart bay, big data, virtual reality, when the fishermen and the wind developers and all the other stakeholders are sitting together, can technology and innovation make that process more efficacy? Can you have better data as we determine what is the best place, because everybody has a say as a stakeholder for the future of offshore wind. Electric cars, not saying we're, we're gonna electrify and have all the 40-foot containers be electrified, 
But we today as consumers in our, electric, in our cars, regardless if it's electric or gasoline driven, expect it to be safe, reliable, and last. So the batteries today, which have spent billions of dollars from the industry to make the electric car on the road today, the question we're asking is why can't you take these same automotive batteries and electrify a port? If we are going to electrify our public transportation system and operate a grid, what's on the other side of that substation? Why can't we electrify our ports and reduce emissions as well? And digital logistics for shipping. Uh, you get a, it's a two for one. If you increase efficiency through digitization, you also happen to reduce emissions. This was a headline that we took out of Silicon Valley. It's on the digital shipping. Note the unsexy part. It's interesting, we in, we in Blue Tech, we're okay with unsexy. The, um, it's not, I didn't hang out with the cool, good looking, rich crowd anyway, so it's fine. Nothing has changed. So our view is, is that, look, shipping, food, offshore wind, smart city, the time is now, in conclusion, to look at innovation, ocean and sustainabilities. The next wave will be blue. Thank you. <laughs>